Well, there's no point in doing power rankings, is there? On Thursday, the XFL announced they are canceling the rest of their regular season. Obviously, for us sports fans, it's been a tough couple days, but we here at General Admission Sports want to make sure there's still things for us all to do to keep sports in our lives. That's the nature of sport. It's escapism in the best possible way. We're the biggest sports fans you can find, so much so it probably gets on the nerves of everyone around us. But for us, it's really important there are still opportunities to talk about sports. So to that end, instead of our weekly power rankings, we've got season-end rankings. That's right. Our rankings today are my final opinions on who would have won the XFL championship had it happened. So let's jump in. The team to finish with the worst record would have been the Dallas Renegades. Of course, by the nature of this video, there's going to be a lot of speculation here. The Renegades had a chance to show that they could change their game plan when their presumed superstar QB went out with injury. Instead, they did the exact same damn thing they'd been doing to lose games for the past couple weeks. Their backup QB threw 49 passes, something even former college star Landry Jones couldn't handle. Their tremendously talented running back Cameron Artis Payne rushed six times. Look, they've avoided the wooden spoon in my rankings this far because they have a very talented roster, but I'm confident in saying that they have the worst coaching staff in the XFL. Their inability to learn and adapt have now cost them at least two games and would have cost them many more. Project that over the next five weeks they would have played and it's very possible the Renegades win one more game, maybe. If the front office has been paying attention, I think it's very possible, if not likely, this is the first XFL coaching change we'll see. Talk about another case of a team severely misjudged by all the experts and pundits, the DC defenders clock in at number seven. Now, yes, they did beat the St. Louis Battlehawks in the last game of the XFL season, and the Battlehawks will finish quite high in these rankings. But remember, this is about guessing where the teams would have finished by the end of the XFL season. And DC shares a lot of the same faults with the Renegades. Things did get better once they benched Cardale Jones, a solution I hope would have been long term. But it's not like Tyree Jackson completely changed the makeup of the team. He went 9 of 14 for 39 yards against St. Louis. That game was much more about the one weakness of the Battlehawks, which I'll get to later, than it was about the ability of the defenders. Jackson could have performed the game manager role better than Cardale Jones, and the defenders have two very talented running backs to shoulder the load. But that's a dangerous game to play in the XFL, where the game moves so fast and nine-point leads can be erased in one possession. The defenders are much closer to number six than they are to number eight without question, but the limitations of their offensive style keep them down at number seven. And speaking of number six, it's the New York Guardians. Now yes, the Guardians just got through with an absolute destruction of the Dallas Renegades, but we've learned before, big wins over bottom-ranked teams should not be taken out of context. This is my last time to remind you, while I was right about the limitations of Landry and Cardale Jones, I had New York ranked number one in my first week power rankings. But when I look at it now, I ask myself this question, and I ask all of you the same, what do you love about the New York Guardians? My answer is simply nothing. They're fine, but what about them is actually dangerous to some of the better teams in the XFL? They certainly got better after benching Matt McGloin, but what could they replace him with? Luis Perez is serviceable, certainly, but not a top guy. Their running game isn't special, their receiving weapons aren't special, their defense isn't special. Good enough to pull off a win here and there, disciplined enough to beat teams with poor coaching and game planning, but ultimately, not special. Just missing out on the playoffs at number five is the Seattle Dragons. There are three teams in these spots that are very close to each other. I'm sure you can guess which teams they are. But the Dragons narrowly miss out on a playoff spot in these rankings, mostly because if I ask myself, can they beat the two teams above them? The answer is no. You guys know how much I like the Dragons coaching and how I feel like BJ Daniels is the perfect Jim Zorn type of guy. But it was a bit too little too late for the Dragons. In the final five weeks, the Dragons would have to play the Wildcats twice and the Roughnecks in the final week. I don't think they would be polished enough to win two of those games, which they would undoubtedly have to do to make the playoffs. I think the Dragons have a good infrastructure here. Invest in some interior offensive linemen to build the run game, get a secondary receiver to complement Austin Prohl, design some more gadget plays to take advantage of Keenan Reynolds. 
there's a future for this for this Dragons team if they play their cards right. But the future would not have been this season. It's so hard to say this given the standings at the halfway point of the season. But I have the Tampa Bay Vipers grabbing the final playoff spot at number four. The Vipers sit at one and four at the halfway point, two games back of a playoff spot. But take a look at the standings in the XFL East right now. Notice anything? The Defenders and Guardians, who I have very little trust in, as you now know, are two of the teams that occupy those spots above the Vipers. The Vipers have upcoming games against both of those teams plus the bottom-ranked Renegades. I firmly believe the Vipers can win all three of those games. Their running game continues to be excellent, Trevor Cornelius is a solid quarterback, though turnover-prone, and their defense is for real. Their weapons at receiver really give defenses some trouble and all three of those teams I just mentioned struggle on the defensive side of the ball. The challenge for the Vipers, given their slow start, will be the two remaining games against the Battle Hawks. They will certainly have to win one of those games to get them to five wins, and that's where the trouble lies for the Vipers. But let's say, for the sake of argument, the Vipers can win in Week 9 against a Battle Hawks team that, by that time, will almost certainly have locked up a playoff spot. If Cornelius can keep his turnovers down, the Vipers can eke out a win against St. Louis and sneak themselves into the XFL playoffs. At number three, no surprises here, it's the LA Wildcats. The Wildcats escaped under very controversial circumstances against the Vipers in week five. Who knows if the Vipers could have actually forced overtime had the clock not run out when it shouldn't have. Regardless though, the Wildcats have improved drastically since Josh Johnson entered the lineup. Under normal circumstances, as I've said, I'd like to see Johnson throwing no more than 30 passes a game. Of course, they got down early against Tampa and Johnson ended up throwing 36, but he did exceptionally well even with an increased load. He went 20 of 36 for 288 yards and four touchdowns. The Wildcats have certain deficiencies, specifically when it comes to their running game and their pass rush, but their strengths are good enough to outweigh their weaknesses, at least until they run into a certain team, which we'll get to right about now. Our next entry is kind of a combo entry because of course we know which teams are occupying our final two spots. The question of who finishes number one comes down to examination of which team wins in a head-to-head -head matchup because I think we can both agree the Roughnecks and Battlehawks are the runaway two best teams in the XFL right now. So let's examine the matchup and who the winner would be should the XFL championship actually happen. These are the two best quarterbacks in the league. Houston's P.J. Walker leads the league in passing yards by a wide margin, and he's on pace for over 2,500 yards in the regular season. Jordan Ta'amu isn't far behind, of course, as the Battle Hawks signal caller clocks in at over 1,000 yards in five games and has added over 200 on the ground. Speaking of the ground attack, the Battle Hawks are far more dangerous in the run game than the Roughnecks. They average over 150 yards a game on the ground, while the Roughnecks clock in at 83. Now I mentioned earlier that the ground game is less important in the XFL given the pace of the game and everything else, but the Battle Hawks use that to their advantage. Their whole team is designed to grind opponents down. They're so dangerous in every facet of the game that you can't key in on one player or even one play type. Tamu's dangerous enough to affect games by himself, both with his arm and his legs, and he's possibly the most efficient quarterback in the league right now. This is a clash of styles if we've ever seen one the balanced, efficient, grinding game of the Battlehawks against the high-flying, flashy, and dangerous attack of the Roughnecks. Even on defense, these teams represent two completely different philosophies. The Battlenecks don't get sacks or force a ton of turnovers, but they shut you down, force fourth downs and punts, and then capitalize once you're playing from behind. The Roughnecks, on the other hand, are an all-or-nothing defense, leading the league in both sacks and takeaways but it's the Battle Hawks that lead in points against. The more I think about this, the more sad I become that we're not gonna get this matchup for the first XFL championship. Ultimately though, what this hypothetical war of attrition comes down to is which style will prevail. And we've all heard the cliches about this, defense wins championships, running games travel, and all the rest. But I happen to believe in all that, which is why my final prediction for how the XFL would have ended is the St. Louis Battlehawks lifting the Vince McMahon trophy. Does any of us really think Vince would name that trophy after himself? Regardless though, previous results aside, the Roughnecks beat the Battlehawks 28-24 in week two. I still believe the Battlehawks come out victorious against the only undefeated team in the XFL. 
The Roughnecks would attempt to get out on top early with a steady diet of P.J. Walker passes and, well, more P.J. Walker passes. The Battlehawks would lock it down and give the ball back to Ta'amu. Their offense chews clock while their run game blasts a Houston defense that hasn't been tested consistently by the great running games in the league. Once the Battlehawks get up early, they put the clamps on. Their defense doesn't generate a ton of sacks or turnovers, but that actually helps against Houston because it means they don't rely on a strategy that wouldn't work against the Roughnecks anyway. The Roughnecks, on the other hand, do rely on rushing the quarterback and forcing turnovers, things the Battlehawks don't allow and don't commit. When push comes to shove, although the Roughnecks have had an easier run through the regular season, it's the Battlehawks that win the head-to-head -head matchup on the biggest stage. A final thought before we say goodbye to our second, soon to be third, favorite recurring series on GA Sports. In researching this video, I didn't look too much at cumulative team stats because it wasn't very relevant to all this speculation we've been doing. But when I finally looked at them more in depth for that Roughnecks Battlehawks discussion we just had, I realized something. My top four teams are the top four offensive teams in the XFL. Is that just a coincidence? I don't think so. The XFL made so many rule changes designed to make the game more exciting and increase offense, and it worked. But it wasn't artificial. We see in college basketball the scoring is going up but because there are so many free throws. So in the NCAA championship, if the referees are calling fewer fouls than either team is used to, that suddenly changes things. Does it matter if you're the best offensive team when you've been relying on free throws this whole time? Of course not, but in the XFL, they've been trying to increase offense organically making rule changes that are entertaining and consistent. Their goal has been to create an offensively driven league, and they've done it in the best possible way. The four best teams are the four best offenses because that's the point, and we all enjoy watching it. This is the most encouraging thing I could say about the XFL. The experiment to create a different kind of football with unique rules without feeling gimmicky has worked. The XFL should last beyond this season. They've shown enough to me to say this is something that could last beyond this season. There is real NFL level talent here. The TV ratings are good enough and the attendance numbers are far from pedestrian so far. The on-field product is different and fun. The presentation is fantastic. Can they coax college players away from the FBS to earn some money while preparing for the NFL? We'll have to see what kind of opportunities the current crop of XFL talent gets going forward, but I'm more than encouraged about the state of the XFL right now and where it could be going given everything we've seen. Thank you so much for keeping up with these rankings every week. Subscribe to GA Sports for all our content now and in the future. We really appreciate you.